So a couple months ago, I made this video that was titled My Experience Interviewing with Apple as an Engineer. I shared with you what the hiring and interview process was like from beginning to end. The entire hiring process with them was approximately four months long and it was made up of five stages. I had to complete a design challenge, do a seven hour long interview panel, and after all of it, unfortunately, I was rejected by them. And Abu If you try to watch that video down, you won't be able to, and that's because Apple had YouTube take it down for privacy concerns. I was gonna stay quiet about it and not really mention anything, but a lot of you messaged me asking what happened to it, so I figured you deserve an explanation. As I explain what happened to that video, I'm gonna be quite careful of what I say. And so that does raise the question, does Apple have beef with me? Is Apple upset with this? And so to answer that, there's four things I need to say. First, my intention with making this video was to show you what it's like to be interviewed by Apple for an engineering position. You know, that's something I wish I would have seen or known when I was in my first year. I wanted to demystify it so when you watch it, you can be better prepared for your Apple interviews or any interviews in tech for that matter. The better prepared you are for these interviews, the better engineer you'll be come and eventually if you do land a job at Apple you'll help make some pretty cool Apple products so I thought it was a win-win second as I was sharing my experience knowledge and giving advice I usually like to be pretty detailed with the information that I deliver but from Apple's perspective as I was talking about the hiring process I maybe gave out too much detail that they didn't like they weren't happy about this and they claimed privacy concerns I understand their perspective they're a trillion dollar company so I'm not gonna fight or argue with them I just did what they wanted and deleted the video and moved on. Third, I've been a huge Apple fanboy for as long as I can remember. I think the first Apple product I had was the iPod Touch second generation back in 2009. And currently I am so into the Apple ecosystem with my M2 MacBook Pro, AirPods, iPad, iPhone 11, etc. So this video that I made where I was sharing again my interview experience with Apple was by no means an intention to harm them or impact them negatively in any way. Again, it was only meant to bring you value. But from my time dealing with this situation I've learned my lesson. Fourth, by no means am I trying to get on Apple's bad side. I hope to one day be invited to attend their WWDC conference in person where they announce all their new products. I also hope one day if it's ever possible to be sponsored by Apple. Uh, I don't think that's something they do, but it would be pretty cool. Those four things being said, does Apple have beef with me? Are they upset with me? Well, they had their lawyers email me asking to remove the video. So even making this video, I was a little worried about it i don't know if it's good to go or hopefully everything is fine making this video again i'm not sharing any private information or proprietary information as i'm explaining what happened i'm just kind of telling you what happened without sharing any secrets but yeah when i got the email from the lawyer obviously again i'm not going to disagree with the trillion dollar company so i deleted the video did whatever they wanted and again moved on i would show you screenshots of the email but i don't know if i'm even allowed to do that so i'm not gonna this was all happening in june so i was extremely stressed that month trying to deal with the whole situation situation and if you notice i didn't even post any videos during that month because again i was so overwhelmed with all this stuff even again making this video i definitely am a little bit overwhelmed as well but i figured you deserve to know what happened there's this famous youtuber named mark rober who used to work for apple and he talked about his experience with apple and how secretive they can be well, we're super excited to have you we just need you to sign this contract and as part of the contract we need you to stop posting your youtube videos I will mention I'm working on it. He just thinks that we should focus on making great products. Please welcome Mark Rover, everybody. Here. This other channel even made a video reenacting his life as an Apple engineer and how secretive they were towards him. So yeah, I really understand it now. Anyways, part of the email that the lawyer sent to me said, Apple does not say that you are unable to post content online, sharing your subjective experiences, interviewing for them as long as you don't infringe on anyone's privacy. So now I understand the mistake I made and now you know the mistake I made because I usually try to be pretty transparent on my channel. So now I'm gonna spend the rest of the video talking subjectively about what the hiring process was like. I'm not gonna share anything about anyone or invade anyone's privacy by any means. I'll explain the engineering concepts I studied in order to prepare for my Apple engineering interview and which technical questions they asked me. All those questions you'll also find available on glassdoor.com. So if you just Google Apple mechanical engineering questions online, you'll find the first link 
go to Glassdoor and it'll show you a long list of questions. Some of them have answers and some of them don't. Anyways, now that you know why the video was taken down, let me subjectively again explain the interview process. When I was interviewing for the Apple product design engineering position, it was broken up into five stages. Recruiter screening, technical interview with the hiring manager, design challenge, seven hour interview panel, and then a final call with the recruiter. The recruiter screening was with one person. The technical interview was also with one person. The design challenge was a catting assignment I had to do. The seven hour interview panel was with 10 different people. Then the final recruiting call was with the same recruiter that I spoke with in the first round. So in total, I had to speak with 12 different people for them to determine if I was worthy enough of this position. But I'm gonna be honest, because I was interviewing with so many people, they all kept asking me, the same questions essentially because i mean there's only so many questions they can ask so they're gonna be repeating themselves now before i tell you which questions they asked me let me share with you how i prepared leading up to the first technical interview i had five days to prepare for the interview on day one i procrastinated and did nothing i figured i have five days so what's the rush on day two i reviewed material science and the most important thing about that topic is understanding a diagram called the stress strain curve stress refers to the force being applied per area and strain refers to how much a part is being deformed or stretched. If we take a piece of material and stretch it by applying a uniform amount of stress, how much it can stretch until the breaks can be explained using this diagram. In an engineering interview, you'll probably be asked to draw this diagram and explain all the important points on it. So let me tell you what each point is. This point right here before the line starts curving is called the yield strength. It divides the graph into two parts. The first part is where we have elastic deformation, which means if I stretch the part at a stress level below the yield strength and let go, it comes back to its original position. But if I apply a stress higher than the yield strength, the deformation would be permanent. The slope of the linear portion on that graph is called Young's modulus or E. It refers to how stiff the material is. This point is the ultimate tensile strength, which is the maximum strength a material can handle before breaking. Finally, this point represents the stress needed to cause the material to break called the fracture point. Every material has a unique stress strain curve that represents it. Materials that are ductile or flexible have a stress strain curve that look like this, while a brittle material will have a stress strain curve that looks like that. I'll put my material science notes in the video description if you're interested. On day three, I reviewed mods. The most important thing about this topic is understanding the cantilevered beam equation, which is delta equals PL cubed over three EI. Let's break down this equation. A beam is just a long sturdy piece of metal or wood, and a cantilever beam is one that's fixed on one end while free to move on the other end. Just like this, P is the force acting here, L is the length, E means Young's modulus, which is a material property that tells us how easy it is to basically stretch a material, and I is the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is just a way to quantify the shape or geometry of the beam. If you rotate this part and say that it has a rectangular cross section, the moment of inertia equation would be I equals BH cubed over 12, where B is the base dimension and H is the height dimension. So a classic Apple question will go like this. Let's say you place a stop sign on the end of a cantilever beam. What can I do to minimize deflection? So if you understand the equation, delta equals PL cubed over 3EI, you should be able to answer that question, no problem. As a matter of fact, I was asked this exact same question in almost every Apple interview I ever did. I'll put my mods notes in the video description as well. Next, I brushed up on GDNT on day four. When we're creating engineering drawings, I can't just tell the manufacturer to make this part eight inches long. That's not enough information. I need to provide them with some kind of geometric characteristics, which is done using these symbols. 14 of them to be exact. These symbols can tell the manufacturer more information on the form, orientation and location of the part, like how straight or how cylindrical a part must be. For example, if I use this symbol to explain how cylindrical a part is, it means if I were to draw two circles and set the distance between them to be 0.25 millimeters, the final manufactured circle must be in this region. So the circle can look like this, like this, or like that, 
all those would qualify as a pass. I'll make sure to put my GDNT notes in the video description as well. Finally, on day five, I went through manufacturing. There's a lot you need to know about this topic, so I'll just quickly summarize it, but you do need to know that there are two types of manufacturing. There is low volume manufacturing and high volume manufacturing. Low volume is when you're making like 10 parts and high volume is when you're making thousands or millions of parts. Within low volume, there's 3D printing, CNC machining, and sheet metal fabrication. Within high volume, there's injection molding and die casting. So I brushed up on these five main manufacturing processes before doing any mechanical engineering interview. Those are usually the five main ones that I would get asked about. So if you have a similar interview to me, definitely recommend brushing up on those five. I'll also put my manufacturing notes in the video description. There is also additional topics you can study like heat transfer and failure analysis, but I wasn't asked about any of those, so I didn't really include it in this study session of mine. Anyways, here's a list of the technical questions they asked me. By the way, the questions I'm sharing aren't confidential because you can find these questions online, on Glassdoor, or on LinkedIn. They tend to recycle the same questions over and over again when they're interviewing candidates. So if you search Apple product design engineering interview questions on Glassdoor, you'll find these there too. Anyways, going back to the overall hiring process in the first technical interview that I did with the hiring manager, she asked me these four questions. One, tell me about yourself. Two, if you have a stop sign placed at the end of a cantilevered beam, how do you reduce the deflection that beam is facing? Three, can you explain and compare the stress strain curve between steel and aluminum? Four, if you were to design the packaging of the MacBook Pro, what things would you consider? Next up was the interview panel. I was really stressed before it, and these were my exact thoughts before the interview panel began. 15 minutes away, um, but a bit stressed, but I got it, just a bit stressed. Anyways, here were the top nine technical questions I got asked during the interview panel. Again, you can find all these questions online or on Glassdoor, so I am not infringing on Apple's rights or intellectual property by any means by sharing these questions with you. They're all already available online. I'm just telling you which of the ones that are available online that I got asked. That's it. One, describe how you would improve our current product packaging. Two, describe the three methods of heat transfer and how they differ. Three, Give me some ways in which you can use heat transfer to cool down an enclosure. Four, why is an I-beam stronger than a rectangular beam? Five, why should you choose a ductile material over a brittle material? Six, what type of manufacturing fit do we use in most of our product packaging? Seven, looking at these two squares and their dimensions, will the inner piece always fit in the outer piece? Eight, how are adhesives manufactured? Nine, if you're in a boat with a brick and you drop that brick into the lake, how does the water level before and after you drop the brick in the lake compare? That was what was going through my head when I was answering the boat question. I don't usually get asked a boat question often, but I did. So I was quick on my feet. I know, ex like, I don't remember the answer because it's like a very technical, not it's technical, but it's just a very... Like there's certain details in the answer that they're looking for that I know they're looking for, but I can't remember right now because I haven't thought about the question in a long time. But I do have the answer of it saved on my computer. So I know exactly the folder and the file that has the answer. So I asked them like follow up, follow up questions, even though I know exactly everything about that question. But all I was asking the follow up questions and he's answering it. Then I can quickly like search my computer, find it and then give him the answer. And so I did that and it was pretty straightforward. You just asked me to draw a free body diagram after I gave him my answer. So I'm pretty sure it's right. But bro, I've been talking for a while now, like is he joining back or what? But anyways, yeah, those are the main technical questions that I was asked during my Apple interviews. Now, during the interview panel, I was surprisingly asked a lot of behavioral questions too. I didn't expect that. And these were my thoughts. I've noticed so far that in these interviews, it's different than like most other interviews I did. Cause like most of the interviews are super technical. I don't think maybe I'll get a super technical interview coming up, but like they're like, stress string curve, can't leave a beam, beam bending, mods, heat transfer, just super technical. But these all seem so behavioral. Like, tell me a time where, you know, a project failed. Tell me a time where the project was successful. Here are the seven most common behavioral questions they asked me. One, tell me about a time where you had a conflict with someone and how you solved it. Two, tell me about a project you worked on that you're proud of. Three, Tell me about a time you succeeded because you correctly anticipated what would happen in the future. Four, how do you work with non-engineers on the team and collaborate with them? Five, tell me about a time where you had to say no to something you really wanted to do. Six, why is the role you're interviewing for interesting to you? Seven, 
Can you describe a small detail in the product or service that you use frequently that makes a difference to you? Now, during the overall interview panel, other than answering their technical questions and behavioral questions, I also had to present the design challenge that I spent a week working on before the interview panel. After finishing that presentation, my nerves were all over the place, and these are my exact thoughts. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I presented my presentation, and I was expecting way more technical questions. I was expecting to be grilled like no tomorrow. The presentation took me about 30 minutes to go through, so I think that was a good length. It wasn't too long, it wasn't too short. I don't know, man. Like, they asked a lot of behavioral questions. I don't know how to feel about that. I, I, I really don't. I hope it's okay. I hope it's good. It felt like I was just, I was just explaining something for work. It's literally what it felt like. And people were just asking questions. Like, no one was just grilling me. I don't know if it's a good thing or not. Is that a good thing? Is it a good thing for them to grill you or not? I'm just so used to being grilled. Like, just imagine getting an offer that says, congratulations. We'd like to move forward and extend you an offer. I'm like, what? Me? Who? Me? Inshallah. We'll see. Yeah, I think I was going a little crazy during the interview. But yeah, that was it. Those were most of the technical and behavioral questions that I was asked in my Apple interviews. So I hope you can take this, practice it for yourself so when you have an Apple interview, you don't mess those up. Again, you can find these questions and even their answers online on Glassdoor or really a bunch of online resources. So I'm not sharing any brand new information. I am not sharing any confidential or proprietary information at all. I just keep reiterating that because I don't want to deal with the same stress that I dealt with in June and I definitely don't want to get into any trouble. That being said, if you want to know how I would answer the technical questions I mentioned earlier or even the behavioral questions, let me know and I could potentially make a completely separate video where I just answer those questions. And I'll also link my engineering notes in the video description if you're interested in looking at them to prepare for your interview. But that's it for now. I'll see you in the next one. Peace!